Um, thanks so much, Omar. I'm really happy to be part of the series. I've been sort of following it at a distance of, uh, over the years, and I was really honored um, to be invited. And also, thank you guys for coming out on this very tense night. I'm sure you're going to be starting to check your email, your, your phones, I don't know, around 9 o'clock, so tell me if anything crazy happens. Um, so I'm going to talk tonight um, about um, three, I, I, you know, I have two kinds of lectures I give, and the one is really an overview of all the work that we do at the center, and other times I decide to focus on two or three projects to sort of get at the heart of um, some more theoretical types of things um, that, we're, that we're trying to experiment with. Um, and I thought that that was more appropriate for the theme of the seminar. Um, and Omar is right, the work that I'm going to show sort of really links um, all of those three things. So I'm going to start um, a little theoretically, just for the first 10 minutes. Um, and then after that, I'm going to show three different projects. Um, one sort of quite unruly uh, uh, project that we're doing about Aleppo in Syria, where we haven't quite come to any conclusions yet, but I'll show you a lot of um, experiments um, in the types of you know, different methods of mapping. The second is about Colombia, um, the country of Colombia. And the third is focusing on the, on the project at the Venice Biennale and is much more narrative, and um, you'll, see, you'll see what I mean by that. So, um, so I'll start just reading the first few pages, and then I'll stop reading after the first 10 minutes, OK, I promise. <laughs> Um, so, the Center for Spatial Research is a hub for interdisciplinary collaboration in, spa in spatial research, and I'm going to try and define a little bit what I mean by that. Um, we link the work of the humanities in the exploding field of digital mapping, spatial data analysis, data visualization, and design, engaging in projects with civic and social orientation, as well as deploying an aesthetic project which treats big and small data as an urban resource to make visible the largely invisible uh, forces transforming cities today for better and more often lately for worse. With the full acknowledgement of this unruly and difficult terrain, our definition of spatial research unites cities and data inextricably. Cities are not simply collections of people and buildings, but also dynamic networks of relationships that generate data, operate with data, and are con more importantly controlled by data. In order to understand cities historically and today, this data must be harnessed, its conditions of production identified and defined, and the feedback loop between what is generated as data or controlled by data must be scrutinized. What are the varying effects that database approaches to the city have had on cities themselves? How can we deploy database approaches to imagine alternative futures for our cities? Data are always about something translated into something else. At their most readable and most relevant to spatial research, data translate people into statistics and space into maps. The icon for this type of visualization of data is called GIS, the Greek Geographic Information System, a medium for spatial research that combines a base map or a physical description of the world with a database that contains many qualities and descriptions of people or things with a known physical address for each unique entry. With the aid of spatial statistics, one can then connect the database to the base map. With this most very simple maneuver, a field of GIS emerges. So I just wanted to sort of lay that out for the more art or audience in the, in the room. Any point, therefore, that has a unique address can be mapped. In this sense, GIS is a way of knowing more about physical space with data. By now, we see these maps in the news just about every day. As a spatial icon, GIS has infinite potential for representing a world, a city, or a community afresh with each data, um, with each data update. Data about cities are constantly collected, updated, and mapped. But what exactly do they show? Mostly, um, they show us about their own limits. Maps are, in fact, arguments about their own constraints. By foregrounding one political boundary above another, a police district or a school district, with image-making technology limiting their ultimate resolution, which is to say, what can they see? And this is very relevant um, when you measure pixels on a satellite image. 
or with methods of projection, um, specific coordinate systems, or with scale or zoom, which determines what can be visible and what cannot be visible on a map, and through the political moment at which they are produced, which is most importantly the purpose or the politics of the map. Maps and the technologies and imaginations used to produce them are instruments of power. As a mode of spatial research and a way of knowing cities, data and cities cannot be separated, nor can data or maps. For this argument, though, about the limits of maps, we need to address data as its own entity, as a medium which informs the map. Data cannot be interpreted or read without knowing its constraints. There is no such thing as raw data. Long lists of numbers or lines of text look raw, but they're just another presentational device. The numbers and text become data when people observe them, read them, make claims about them, and their outputs can be very different depending on the political and social resources available to observe the situation. Data are always collected for a purpose and constrained by people, institutions, or machines which collect them. Nothing about data, despite the etymology of the word, is given, not the numbers, the rules for analyzing them, or the forms in which we see them. Without observation, decision, translation, interpretation, and memory, which is to say without intervention, there would be no data. Data are taken, not given. If spatial research inextricably links cities and data, what kind of knowledge about cities is produced? A definition of cities as generators of data implies that maps are the medium through which we do our work. If data and maps, along with their limits, represent cities both politically and aesthetically, what kinds of operations and politics are ensnared in this configuration? Data and maps of cities have other limits in representation, especially politically. You might not be on the map. It is important to understand that data and maps and the maps that they generate are never complete. From the most common census, to the forced migration across borders, to crimes of war, to environmental refugees, it is hard to count everyone, and yet every person counts. And you'll see this conundrum in a lot of the projects that we're working on. Despite this, data sets like these and the gaps in their data are often a starting point for where and how to work with them and how they work, how they do work in the world. Within this critical frame, when spatial data are a resource as well as an input, Cities are a field of study, and conflict urbanism emerges as an output of spatial research. This is obviously an algorithmic way of thinking, and it points to the invisible black box of computation that link data, the city, and its conflictual histories and futures. Conflict urbanism has been our research focus over the last three years at the center, examining the role of conflicts of all sorts in making and remaking cities around the world. Conflict urbanism is a term that designates not simply that conflicts take place in cities, but also conflict as a structuring principle of cities, as a way of inhabiting and creating urban space. The increasing urbanization of warfare and the policing and surveillance of everyday life are examples of the term, but conflict is not limited to war and violence. We have worked with a large range of colleagues in the humanities and a number of external partners to map and analyze the ways cities are both destroyed and built through conflict. They have long been arenas of friction, difference, and dissidence, and their irreducible conflictual character manifests in everything from neighborhood borders to differences of opinion and status to ordinary encounters on the street. Bringing humanistic inquiry together with spatial research, data and maps allow us to represent the multiple geographies of urban injustice at the base of the conflict. Sometimes, however, injustice is slow-moving, structural, built-in, affecting many people over many generations. These types of injustices can be normalized, often by blaming its victims, naturalized, or simply hidden but behind apparently objective representations. Maps made with data, when used critically, can be transformative ways of challenging conventional narratives about political and social divisions. With data as a resource and maps as a medium, we are addressing conflict urbanism, literally putting it on the map. Once mapped, conflict urbanism explores the antagonistic dimensions of inequality and injustice as it is expressed spatially in situations of war, displacement, and exclusion. 
in the course of our work, we are confronting the history of the uses of maps and data to shape urban life. Tied to its capacity to represent the spatial world, data also has the power to intervene in it and change it. Conflicts can and should be investigated with data, but they often turn out to be propelled or propagated by it as well. This insight we find as a call to action. In our work, we have done a lot to visualize seemingly invisible injustices in order to understand the magnitude of this problem. However, if urban spatial data is this powerful, how today can we harness it to shape cities in more equitable, equitable ways? How can humanistic modes of inquiry be substantively be incorporated to inform and not merely to interpret these processes? So I'd say that's sort of a turning point um, in the work that, that we're doing lately, and we're trying to sort of transform um, all, the pro all the projects that we're doing from simple uh, representations to how they might act in the world. And that doesn't mean you have to sort of go outside of the map into the so-called real world. Um, you can act in a lot of different ways, and we can talk about that through these various projects. Um, okay, so as I said, um, each of the projects that I'm going to show is a kind of navigation, uh, is a kind of navigation with data. I'm going to talk about these three different projects. Um, so the title, I forgot about the title, demapping, <laughs> suggests that I'll suggest that I'll uh, address some of the ways in which ma maps and data participate in the making and unmaking and remaking of space. The cycle involves many invisible processes of change, and I'll focus on recent projects that display the limits of this cycle, as well as the potential to break it as a form of demapping or countermapping, using maps to remap the data with which we are working. Okay, so conflict, um, urbanism, Aleppo. We, you, you cannot actually imagine the mounds of data that we had access to and collected and transformed into data along the way. So high resolution uh, satellite imagery, um, a lot of YouTube video, which is not necessarily thought of as a spatial database, which we transformed into a spatial database, and I'll talk about that a little later, um, and an interactive map. So, um, and this is an open street maps um, variation of, of Aleppo, but this set of, do we have a clicker? I uh, don't think so, okay. Um, but the, the neighborhood names on the left are not something that you would have found on open street maps. And in fact, that list of names is very difficult to translate between English and Arabic. There's all different variations on it. So what we made and, uh, and sort of allowed people to browse um, the city during these years of the war with a neighborhood um, database and a series of satellite images which were specifically curated for this particular map. So this is Aleppo uh, zoomed in to the, to the citadel, 2012. Um, 2014, you can already see the damage that has occurred, uh, 2015, and then 2016. So much of the work here revolved around how to create spatial data sets where they did, had not previously existed. And to facilitate that kind of work, um, the interactive map combines layers of high resolution imagery together with data generated by a branch of the UN dedica dedicated to satellite research, UNITAR UNOSAT. And so now you can see these little dots which uh, represent damage that was found in the city by pouring over these high resolution satellite images looking at the before and after to see what happened. So the map allows users to navigate the city of Aleppo by neighborhood and browse through our, archi our archive on, with these full high-resolution satellite images. The resolution of the images is 50 centimeters, which until recently had been the highest resolution available to civilians. And if those of you who don't know, you can actually purchase a high-resolution satellite image. So this is not like the Google map that you uh, that 
that you use every day, you can purchase an image of a very specific date at a very specific time and use it to investigate specific events that you think you know have occurred. So um, the high resolution imagery that we make use of here, and that's the basis of a lot of the last book that I wrote, um, were declassified and generally made available about 15 years ago, but they're still extremely expensive to purchase. Um, along with that, um, we've, we've, so this in, in fact is a drone video, um, which I'll talk about later, and it was not made by the military, it was made by an activist organization called the Aleppo Media Center. So in the end, what we've done is created an archive and a resource which we hope will become useful as a framework for documenting crimes of war, as well as speculating about how Aleppo might be rebuilt in the future. Um, okay, and so here's the UNICEF image, and this is the final map of damage um, of the whole five-year span of the war, and I'll talk about this um, split in the city. So it's really important um, in our project to clarify um, that it's, it's not about um, refugees, although refugees were the result, the, um, were the result of, of, this, of, of the war. Um, but we decided to focus very specifically on urban damage in Aleppo. So that's where the conflict urbanism theme comes in. Um, and we did that for a reason. Um, Raphael Lemkin's concept um, of vandalism serves as a motivating rationale and theoretical frame for all of the work we've done on Aleppo. A Polish Jewish lawyer, Lemkin coined the term genocide during World War II and campaigned tirelessly for the Convention on, on the Prevention and Punishment of crimes of genocide adopted by the UN General Assembly in December 1948 and entered into force in January 1951 after 25 states, uh, after 20 states had ratified it. But already in 1933, Lemkin described what he then called offenses against the law of nations a term in terms of two interlinked concepts, barbarity and vandalism. He understood barbarity as primarily as acts of extermination, targeting ethnic, religious, or social collectives, and vandalism as the systematic and organized destruction of the arts and cultural heritage in which unique genius and achievement of a collectivity are revealed in fields of science, arts, and literature. And that's a quote from Lemkin. What he called barbarity became the core notion of genocide, but vandalism did not make it into the Genocide Convention. It is, however, reflected in the 1954 Hague um, Convention for the Protection of Cultural Property in the Event of Armed Conflict, which became effective in 1956. Although recent developments in international criminal law have incorporated the destruction of cultural heritage into the understanding of genocide, the UN Tribunal for ex Yugoslavia noted in one decision that, quote, where there is physical or biological destruction, there are often simultaneous attacks on cultural and religious property and symbols of the targeted group as well, attacks which may legitimately be considered as evidence of an intent to physically destroy the group, unquote. It was only recently, uh, or in September 2016, that such attacks themselves that such attacks themselves were found to constitute a war crime. Judges in the International Criminal Court in The Hague sentenced Ahmed al faki al-Mahdi to nine years in prison for his role in demolishing historic Muslim shrines in Timbuktu. The case marks the first time in an international court um, where they have convicted a defendant for the destruction of cultural heritage as a war crime. In this trial, however, the burden of proof did not rely on the prosecution since al-Mahdi confessed to this crime, and so in the future it might remain difficult to try this erasure of culture in a court of law, and most of the time this attempt has failed repeatedly. So in the midst of the civil war in Aleppo, we have created a map to assess damage to the built fabric of Aleppo, Halab, one of the oldest and 
often said, most continuously inhabited cities in the world using satellite image images. So um, this project actually was displayed at the Istanbul Design Biennale. Um, and um, the theme of which was, what, what is it um, to be human? And they framed the, the whole exhibit as two seconds, two days, two years, 200 years, and 200,000 years. Um, and we used that provocation, actually, instead of saying we're going to be in one of these scales, we said Aleppo is actually all of these scales combined into one. So, of course, a satellite image is a split, you know, a split second in time, and we had three of them. Um, then there was the fact that two days after this image was taken in 2012, um, the, the mosque of, it, the, you know, the oldest mosque in Aleppo was destroyed two days later. We thematized that as the two days. Um, over the five, then for two years, over the five years of the civil war in Syria, many buildings and neighborhoods in Aleppo have been destroyed, extending far beyond the souk and the old city. Craters mark the buildings and streets and parks, and a conflict ecology has become visible in the overhead images. That's this kind of haunting green of the 2016 images. Three satellite images tell us some of the stories of this ongoing erasure and its varied aftermaths, depths, departures, and haunting green growth of vegetation that has come to cover and identify the damaged spaces. It, too, is an outcome of the war and a sign of ne neglect and inattention, some purposeful and some inadvertent. Um, and then there was this amazing thing that in uh, Istanbul, our project was displayed in the Archaeology Museum. And there was actually, in the Archaeology Museum, a, a column um, from one of the previous wars in Aleppo, where the symbol of the victory was taking this column and putting it in the, taking it to, to Istanbul. And it, it's proudly displayed there as well. So it's part of this whole looting um, of one culture displaying it in another, which is something actually Ariella Azale um, is beginning to work on. And we, we sometimes talk about working on it together and instead of a migration of people, a migration of things. Um, and these can be tracked from one museum to the other because of these records that are kept um, in museums. So in terms of the 200,000 years, it also, um, uh, Aleppo, I don't know if you know about this, it's a seed vault, it's a backup of um, seeds all over the, all over the world that, have, that are in danger of extinction and you can keep your seeds here in uh, Norway. The first time it was open, it, was, it wasn't even built that long ago, only in 2007, but it, already it was opened for the seeds um, of Aleppo because there was a seed bank, a genetic seed bank that had been destroyed. And so they went to this particular place and took some of the seeds to continue their research. Um, so there, there it was for the Istanbul Biennale. Uh, 200,000 years to two seconds, multiple erasures, displacements, creation, and growth are embedded in the pixels, revealing a city shaped and structured by destruction, at least some of which um, will be recorded as crimes of war in the future. So um, another part of what we did, as I described to you, the UNISAT images um, are high resolution images, extremely expensive to buy. Um, Human Rights Watch had another a couple of these images, which they gave us access to. Um, but the most prevalent and free images are Landsat images. And while we were tracking uh, the war, it was actually really frustrating. Uh, we were always years behind where we wanted to be in terms of our analysis. So working with a remote sensing uh, scientist, this is a composite image, Jamin Vanderhoek uh, composited all these images together. And what you can see is mostly clouds <coughs> and over the city of Aleppo. Um, but what he did was look every two weeks. One of these images were taken every two weeks. And when you detect a change in a pixel, um, you, you would say something happened in the city. 
and we knew that there was a war and there was a high chance that this had something to do with uh, urban damage. So then he classified the pixels into significant damage um, and when we linked it to high resolution imagery, we found that some of this was valid as an experimental technique. So this is the... And then we found some YouTube video in our same archive to show that this road was damaged, right? So this is, if any of you know forensic architecture, um, this kind of work is linked um, to the kinds of things they do. So here again is the YouTube um, archive, which when we first tried to map it, it was really incohate. You couldn't, you know, you, the images were sort of one on top of each other. Um, and so then we realized that there was metadata attached to each YouTube video, which could then be that they, uh, that they labeled it by a date and the neighborhood name. And so we could then make a map of three um, very activist um, YouTube uh, uh, channels. They, they actually were called channels. Um, particularly AMC has a really amazing um, range of videos, which if you, bra if you click on it and you start browsing these videos, you, you, can look at, you can look at some of them. HNN is the Halab News Network. And the White Hel Helmets, as we know, they're very controversial. Um, but these were the YouTube channels that were used by newspapers uh, worldwide because it was too dangerous for journalists to go to Aleppo. So there was this whole question of what was the vid validity of these videos. Um, so by, le se by selecting uh, channels that we knew was somewhat trustworthy, we've now created an archive which is there for future use. And we've used some of it ourselves. Um, we've made these absolutely insane timelines um, trying to link YouTube video to Landsat imagery to high resolution imagery and are starting to work our way uh, through various stories. Um, one of which is trying to understand the geography of the city which before the war there was a massive uh, master planning effort by the Assad government um, trying to think about what to do with the many in so-called informal neighborhoods on the east side of the city. Um, this is actually the many of those neighborhoods became the first uh, locations in which the battle uh, was established. Um, so here, for example, Majed, are you in the audience still? Majed, actually, <laughs> he translated um, he translated this for us, and I'm looking for the uh, for what it said. But it's basically pointing uh, to places around this neighborhood, which is called Salah Adin, and he's he's saying it is now um, a rebel stronghold, and thank goodness we have managed to uh, preserve this place. Um, and so here. Um, are some of, you know, here are some of the pointers. We sort of took the video and ground truthed it with this high resolution image. Um, the, the rebel fighter is, that's where the per person was walking around. There's the round, um, the roundabout and the mosque and, and we'll see that a little later as well. So then it turned out upon further analysis that there were two major roads coming into the city, one from the south which, and, and one from the north, and it was really um, a battle between the two forces of how to control this road and uh, uh, how you know, uh, food and electricity and uh, goods got into the city was also through, and weapons, of course, uh, were through these two roads, and it really was a battle of who was in control of what. So while um, the, the city was divided between the government control and the so-called rebel control, which was highly uh, varied and uh, not, as you know, not as unified as everybody um, imagines, um, that's, how, that's how the damage really played out. 
Um, the black dots over here are the informal parts of the city, which uh, ended up showing the most, the most damage of all. Um, and the, here, let's see if this works. Um, that shows, when I showed you that Costello Road, this place here, Ashrafare, Ash, uh, um, is right by Costello Road. And once that stronghold was taken, that's when the siege of Aleppo started and no more food or water could be delivered into that whole eastern part of the city. Um, so, you know, this is what we've been trying uh, to, to understand, sort of how and where the, the war took place. We're finally starting to understand the geography and we're gonna then collate it with all these YouTube videos. Um, it turns out, in fact, that the war started and ended in the same place in, at Salah Adin, where Majed um, translated that, that YouTube video. Um, and you can see over here, it is the, it's that exact same spot. So. And this was the final uh, drone video that in fact was published by the New York Times just days before um, the, the war ended and this music was all designed by them. Um, and so this channel, the Aleppo Media Channel, um, we, we started trying to communicate with them. I had a few students who spoke Arabic um, and it was just shocking to me that in the, the New York Times, they, they, Michael Kimmermon talked about this as an abstract military video because of the overhead view. It was abstract. You look, you can't, people are too, so tiny. Um, you know, what is, what is this trying to communicate? Whereas, in fact, it was made by uh, one of these, this video collective to try and show the world how, you know, how devastating and total the damage actually was. Um, and so she communicated with him, and he did not even know that his video was on the front page of the New York Times. Uh, the New York Times did not even attribute the video to a specific person. Um, so if you, look at our, if you look at our website, that whole communication between Nadine and the author uh, of many of these, of these videos is, um, is really amazing and very kind of moving. So that's where we are um, with Aleppo. Um, it's just a giant archive um, ready to be uh, interrogated even <laughs> even more. It's really I consider it a really unfinished uh, a really unfinished project. Uh, don't quite know how to finish it if if it ever will possibly you know even if it will be finished. So, but there will be many more stories that will come out of the combination of the specific times um, and the types of video. So here is a completely different project, right? You saw there were like 100 different uh, types of data that we were, that we were analyzing over there. Um, and this um, is a map right here of the 50 years of the, of the Civil War in Colombia in South America. So at a first glance, it is extremely difficult to grasp the scope of the Colombian conflict. It spans more than 50 years and covers most of the country's territory. It even crosses borders into neighboring Ecuador, Venezuela, Peru, and Brazil, and it includes multiple actors from both the right and the left who at times have fought against it and at times profited from illegal drug business, and it has been shaped and reshaped by a multiplicity of political and socioeconomic forces and has generated millions and millions of victims of displacement, homicide, massacres, and sexual violence. More recent developments include a long and controversial demobilization project by far-right-wing paramilitary groups and the current peace process with left-wing guerrillas of the FARC, which have polarized the country. The most recent peace accord has been in the making for more than four years and produced an agreement that was signed by the government and the FARC and then rejected by the Colombian people through a referendum, only to be modified and approved again by members of the Colombian legislative body. As a part of this ongoing peace process, the government has been collecting um, 
uh, surveys um, of, of victims of violence uh, in the hopes of uh, giving them reparations, right? So this is a huge database that is collected by the government. So with that, it carries all the biases that come along with it. But um, um, but it's the most complete data set that, that there is of what happened over the 50 years of the war, or one of the most complete um, sets of evidence. And so um, what we wanted to do actually was to track internal displacement, right? You often hear about urban-rural migration, you hear about migration across borders, and most of the time, I've, we've even made those kinds of maps in the center, it goes from center of country to center of country because as soon as you have 5,000 people crossing a border, you can make a map. As soon as you have 5,000 people internally displaced, you can draw a line, but you don't really know where to draw a line from and to. And because of this incredibly detailed database, and we got a little bit more uh, granular access to the data through Juan Saldariago, who's from Colombia, and he had um, uh, relations over there that, that helped us get this data. Um, and we made this m map, which really shows where people moved um, from and to. So let me show you. Sorry, these files are quite big. Okay. No, this has no sound, right? So each line on this map represents one person. White is the origin, and orange is the destination. And so it just starts in 1985, and we just visualize this data set. Um, and I'm not going to sit here and play it for you for 10 minutes. You can look at it on the website. But what's amazing is that you start seeing patterns um, of intensity of the, of the war. So, And starting in the late 90s, um, it really does get totally packed. <laughs> And then you also see these bursts of motion, um, <clears throat> which ha have to do with very specific events in relation to the unfolding. And so then we went from there um, and zoomed in on some specific moments where you can see the relation can you, can you read things? Yeah, of a specific event to what is going on at a particular moment in time. And what was amazing was that um, people didn't just leave a city and not come back and, and, and go back to their home city. They actually moved and then other people moved into the city and that's what we started noticing as a, as a pattern, that people didn't move in predictable, in predictable patterns at all um, and that sometimes more people uh, arrived in a city after um, a lot of people had been forced out and that was another pattern. And people often moved from medium-sized city to medium-sized city or small city to small city, didn't only move from small city to big city or from rural to urban. Um, and so, again, we're in the middle of this and trying to understand what those patterns mean um, in terms of the conflict itself. Okay, that's not... Okay. So that's Colombia, and I'm going to finish um, with a project that's currently still on display at the Venice Biennale, and we were in the U.S. Pavilion, and it's called Dimensions of Citizenship. It's trying to take on a little bit um, uh, our relationship to our current administration. 
um, there were various scales of, uh, again, I don't know why people like, the curators are <laughs> dividing things up into scales. So there was the individual scale, the regional scale, the <laughs> national scale, and we were given the global scale. Um, and so this was a collaboration between Diller, Scafidio, and Renfro, and the Center for Spatial Research, and Bobby Pietrusco at the GSD at Harvard. And we'd all worked before together on a show at the Cartier Foundation, which was a prompt uh, actually by Paul Virilio um, to map the reasons for which people move around the world for political, environmental, and uh, economic reasons. So, you know, forced migration, voluntary migration, et cetera. So they wanted to reshow that, um, that exhibit. It just didn't seem to make sense. Um, so we did, we did something new, um, and here's what the, okay, so here's two globes. They're actually produced by the same satellite, the Suomi, the Suomi, the Suomi satellite. Um, this is a, on the, your right, on the left is the daytime view of Earth, um, one in the afternoon, and on the, le on the right is the, what's called the black marble, which are the night lights, um, the night lights. Um, so when I look at an image like this, um, most of the time it's, it's framed as connectivity, as the ways in which you know, humans are connected to each other through electricity, through economics, through financialization. I look at this map and I see gaps. Um, and so we kind of had a hunch that, this, that on this map there, there would be um, many populations where there were people and no lights and many uh, parts of the world where there would be lights and no people. And we just operated on that gut instinct um, and decided, and we, we knew because we were um, at Columbia and we often uh, work with a lab called Season and they produce uh, every five years what's called a gridded population of the world, where they assemble all the censuses produced by governments around the world, and they rasterize them uh, into these pixelated maps. So if you click on a pixel, it says, this many people live on this one kilometer by one kilometer piece of Earth, right? So if you look at India, the way the census is communicated to you is much less precise than the way that it's uh, uh, delivered to us in the United States. So here you get a much clearer picture of cities versus rural, and you don't in India. So there's a lot of uh, variability in the, in, in the way the census is counted, but needless to say, you can get a sense of how many people there are in the world. So what we did was we took the gridded population of the world and the black marble, and they're both on the same one kilometer grids, and you subtract them from another, one another. And then you can see there are places in the world where there are relatively more people than light, and places in the world where there's relatively more lights than people. And when we did that, we then you know, created a bunch of centroids, and then we found these 16,000 points where Yellow means there are lights and no people, and uh, blue means there's people and no lights. And then we were tasked, okay, what are we gonna do with this? We've got 16,000 points. Um, and we had to come up with a whole bunch of filters um, in order to tell stories. Um, so first I'm just gonna show you this. We, it's part of the narrative was unpeeling uh, the globe. This is actually a very specific, very old German projection, which was used to try and uh, uh, map the oceans, where there were still monsters present in the oceans when they were first discovered, when they were first mapped. Okay. Um, okay, so then the first scene was talking about the, ab the fact that the absence of light does not always mean the absence of people. <coughs> and then we picked out specific places in the world, and this was based on the way that we filtered the data to look for common uh, types of um, inhabitation, which had this specific condition. So 
range from a wealthy enclave where in Flagstaff, Arizona, they have codes to make the cities darker so that you can see the light, so you can see the stars, to refugee camps which had no electricity, to uh, you know places where there had been a, a hurricane, to uh, you know informal cities, to indigenous territories to cities which are politically denied light, like in North Korea. Um, and then that sort of zoomed in. And so here you're seeing the most basic pixel, which is, you know, these are these eight abstract uh, definitions of darkness. And that faded into a daylight uh, view of what was there. And you could see what was dark had a lot of, obviously, a lot of buildings, uh, a lot of evidence of human habitation. Um, so the next, and this became a more narrative uh, part of the part of the show where we zoomed in on specific places. So this is where there's lights and no people. And again, we filtered the information: industrial farms, power plants, ports, tourism sites, natural gas extraction, fracking, that kind of thing. And again, it shifts into the daylight view of those spaces. No, no, not, it doesn't, okay. Yeah, <laughs> okay. So then from there, um, we zoomed in and we told three stories um, about these conditions. So this is in the DRC in Africa, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, where there was um, a copper mine um, which had this condition of bright lights and no people, um, linked to a dam um, on the other side of the, literally on the other side of the country, um, and a high voltage power line which connects the dam to the copper mine, which needs, as you can imagine, a lot of energy and electricity, and many, many cities and villages and towns along the way which showed up in our uh, black marble as people no lights. And this condition where there's that kind of inequality is a very common one um, around the world. And from that type of uh, pattern, we then narratively tried to link that to 128 places around the world. But first, these are the eight uh, pixels showing the dark places. And you can see the numbers of people that are actually living there. 22,000, I can't see, 146,000, 2 million, you know, significant uh, amounts of people with no electricity at one in the morning. Doesn't mean, you know, that's a common. And then these are the, um, the Glencore mines all around the world. They own 225 mines. And if, I'm sure if you look, if you zoomed in on each one of them, you would find these kinds of uneven conditions. So we did that, and then these just sort of spread out. Those are the actual pixels, one kilometer by one kilometer. I keep going, there's just two more stories, okay? So this um, is Punta Cana, a tourist resort in the Dominican Republic, um, which is reliably lit by a private generator, and this is another uh, condition of the way electricity is, um, operates in the world. So that little town over there um, has very uneven electricity. And in fact, in the whole of the Dominican Republic, there's very uneven electricity, except for these tourist resorts. And why they show up as <clears throat> lights and no people is because tourists are not counted in government censuses. So obviously, right? So this was a, another kind of anomaly. <clears throat> And the public ut utility is, if you talk to anyone from the Dominican Republic, it's <clears throat> really inconsistent supply. Okay. 
And then again, we link that to 128 tourist sites around the world, all of which have this type of inequality. <laughs> and often very close to the ocean. <laughs> so you can see in the images. And then that faded into the pixels. And this um, is Peru. This is a bright spot. This is one of my favorite images, this bright spot of light in the Amazon, um, <clears throat> where there's uh, natural gas extraction for uh, fracking. <coughs> So again, there are these major pipelines which go from the coast to the, to the middle of the Amazon. And you know, this case is, it's, it's very complex because you don't wanna say, uh, indigenous people don't want electricity, but you also don't want to say they need electricity. Um, and so there's a very sort of double, uh, double negative, um, and it was, it was very hard to, to pinpoint um, what the, collect, what the co correct political argument is. But this natural gas extraction um, around the world is in very similar is in very similar situations. Okay, and then the last scenario, because we were at the, um, in the U.S. pavilion, we decided we needed to focus on the U.S. Um, and the U.S. supposedly has 100% uh, electricity delivery, um, except in, in situations um, where there are natural, so-called natural disasters and hurricanes. And, um, <laughs> We were looking at Houston and Puerto Rico, which had hurricanes just one month apart from each other. So there's Houston, Puerto Rico. Okay, so just while this is uh, playing out, it's actually really easy to read the, the message of this. It's just to say that I've showed uh, three very different types of projects. Um, the one is really experimenting uh, with and you know, trying to decide what spatial research is and what are methods by which we can uh, understand conflict. Um, through working through um, a single database about violence over long periods of time um, that is also analytical and trying to establish patterns. 
and then this other kind of work where we really try um, and communicate with narrative um, through data in art in, in art contexts. And you know, we've really showed one of each, but if you go to our website, you'll see a number of projects that iterate on these three different types of formats of communication with maps and data. Thank you.